Mzanzi Afrika Moleni. This week marks one full year since we went into lockdown in March 2020. And what a year it has been. From bans on headdressing to tobacco and alcohol to NGOs being blocked by government from providing meals to desperate South Africans. And now we have an unfolding human rights crisis on our hands as vaccine rollout is yet to move beyond the trial stage. In fact, at the current vaccination rate, it will take almost 20 years to reach the population immunity South Africa needs for life to return back to normal. Today, we take you on a wild ride looking back at the last year and unpack what we can expect going forward. But first, we take a look at the weekend headlines. NC Deputy President David Mabuza says the governing party needs to fast track the issue of land expropriation. It is here and it is here to stay. It is going to happen. There are serious concerns over government's vaccine program and the rate at which jabs are being administered. There are even calls for the private sector to get involved in obtaining more vaccines. The backgevecht is in the DOA in the Universiteit Stellenbosch where questions around the Universiteit nieuwe taalbeleid wordt steeds voort. This is a a very serious transgression of the uh, provisions contained in our constitution, which explicitly says that everyone has the right to enjoy parity of, ex of esteem in, in speaking their mother tongue. We will make sure that we root out corruption, and if it affects any of us, we must be accountable. You must say, I'm going to subject my members of cabinet to the following measures to give the public confidence that I'm acting. So don't expect load shedding to come to an end anytime soon. That's according to ESCOM executives who say their maintenance plan will lead to a shortfall of power generation for at least five years. This week in the headlines, we have little to celebrate this Human Rights Day as vaccine rollout stalls. ESCOM wastes 20 million rand on burning diesel and Didi Mabuza announces that land expropriation will be fast-tracked. But first, President Ramaphosa and his cabinet had failed to meet yet another deadline to submit lifestyle audits, which are designed to check that ministers are living lifestyles in line with their income and not benefiting from corrupt deals. The initial deadline for these lifestyle audits was October 2018. It's now almost three years later, and we will be missing the new deadline of the 31st of March. In contrast, the Western Cape government only took a few months to initiate and complete lifestyle audits for all provincial cabinet ministers. It is clear that there's absolutely no political will for this to happen and for cabinet to be fully transparent with the people of South Africa. Last week, Deputy President David Mabuza announced that farms previously identified for land reform purposes will now be expropriated without compensation. The reality is that Section 25 of the Constitution is yet to be amended, so this move would be completely unconstitutional. These latest comments reinforce what we've been saying all along, that national government has no respect for the parliamentary process which is currently underway and is happy to simply silence your voice on this, forging ahead with no regard for the views of the people of South Africa. After 27 years, land reform has failed, not because of the constitution, but because of the ANC. The amendment of the constitution is a scapegoating mechanism that seeks to mask government failure on land reform and restitution. The constitution was never the problem. The ANC government is. It turns out ESCOM can willingly suspend load shedding when it wants to. Last week, as a kind gesture, they suspended rolling blackouts for King Goodwill's Relatini's memorial service. But this act of kindness cost us 20 million rand in diesel to keep the lights on long enough for South Africans to watch the president give the eulogy at the memorial service. It appears that the services that ESCOM are meant to deliver, that are meant to deliver for all of us, are only delivered for some. This is yet another illustration of life in South Africa today at the hands of the ANC government. One set of rules for insiders and one set of rules for the rest of us. 
And it's clear that government will never fix the problems at ESCOM. Not because they don't, because simply they don't ever experience the devastation of rolling blackouts like the rest of us do. It seems the crisis at SAPS is like the Saw movies, never ending, costly and a terrible horror show. The latest is that more than 4,000 police vehicles are out of service in five different provinces. Just in KZN alone, 2,500 cars are out of service. This is a time where visible policing is desperately needed in so many communities. We spend more money buying new German SUVs for ministers than we do on police vans to protect the nation. And this week we commemorated Human Rights Day. And we remember those who were killed in the struggle for the rights we have today. May we never forget their sacrifice. However, this year's Human Rights Day was a stark reminder of how dangerously close we have come to violating some of these hard-won rights in the last year. Government's vaccine rollout program is failing. The police are abusing and killing citizens. And basic services are crumbling across the country. Furthermore, like a wolf in ship's clothing, the ANC has used the Disaster Management Act to strip us of these basic rights while pretending that they are doing so purely to stop the spread of COVID-19. What is desperately needed now is for government to urgently roll out a vaccination program to its citizens so that our country can return back to normal. And finally, in the spirit of Human Rights Day, the DA has launched a petition to protect the right to mother tongue education at Stellenbosch University. This comes after students were banned from speaking Afrikaans on campus. We will hand over this petition and proposed amendments to a new draft language policy. We urge all citizens who care about mother tongue education to sign the petition. Abantu basemzansi Afrika jikelele banolungelo lokusebenzisa ulwimi lwabo kanga ngoko naphi na amasebe ezemfundo anyanzelekile akhuthaze usetyenziso lwelwimi zonke zasemzansi Afrika In the spotlight this week we mark one year of lockdown and we take a look back at what South Africa has been through during this pandemic And as the nation's vaccination program stall we ask where to from here Let's take a look at this story in the spotlight. A year on and COVID-19 has impacted every sector of the country. The less fortunate have been left in an even worse situation. What is the full planning for our children that doesn't have access to e-learning, that doesn't even have access to a meal? Great to see South Africans opening their hearts as we've seen for weeks now already. Alleged PPE tender irregularities are emerging. COVID corruption is a massive problem in South Africa. We believe that this is a pioneering effort that should be adopted across the country. Applicants express their concerns of possibly contracting COVID-19 while waiting in the queue, but say they have no other choice. Alexander resident Collins Kozak lost his life allegedly at the hands of law enforcement officers. The Cape Town International Convention Center was converted into the largest COVID-19 field hospital. The lockdown tobacco ban will remain in force. The South African wine industry will soon be bleeding jobs. Urgent intervention is needed to take pressure off the healthcare system. It cannot be done at the expense of people's livelihoods. There are millions of jobs that have been lost since we began lockdowns in South Africa. The unemployment insurance fund has come under fire due to for technical glitches. A majority of beaches across the country have been closed under level 3 lockdown. Non-compliance will be dealt with very harshly. In this mobile footage, hospital workers in the KwaZulu-Natal province mourn the death of another colleague to COVID-19. The need for a vaccine is now more urgent than ever. It is almost
almost exactly one year since South Africa had its first confirmed COVID-19 case, experienced unprecedented pressures on our healthcare system, and was placed under one of the world's longest and harshest lockdowns. And during this time, the ever-extended Disaster Management Act enabled government to operate without any form of oversight and accountability. We saw irrational restrictions with devastating effects for the most vulnerable South Africans who couldn't get humanitarian assistance from NGOs, businesses shut their doors, and millions more were joining the unemployment queue. In the first 40 days of lockdown alone, 32 South Africans were killed and 25 allegedly tortured at the hands of the police. But undoubtedly, the biggest violation of human rights has been government's failure to procure and roll out COVID-19 vaccines. You may be under the impression that vaccine rollout has begun and is well underway since January when the first shipment arrived to much fanfare. This is not the case. There is only a small Johnson & Johnson trial underway for a small group of healthcare workers. Countries the world over are vaccinating people in their hundreds of thousands daily. Countries similar to South Africa are making great headway in while rolling out their vaccine and yet our vaccine rollout plan is essentially dead in the water. It is an absolute non-starter, an utter and colossal failure. The likes of Rwanda are averaging 140,000 vaccinations a day, Chile 100,000 vaccinations a day, and yet as of yesterday, it marked three days running with zero vaccinations being administered in South Africa. Not a single jab in a single arm. For Human Rights Day, we launched our vaccine tracker to illustrate the true scale of the crisis before us. The stated aim of national government to reach population immunity by the end of this year, and that is the only time we can really hope to return to some semblance of normality in South Africa. As of yesterday, less than 200,000 South Africans have been vaccinated overall since January, and this is all still a trial for healthcare workers. To reach population immunity by December, we should have vaccinated 1 million people by the end of this month. At this rate, it will take us almost 20 years to reach 67% of all South Africans. In any other country, entire governments would fall for such a failure. But because ultimately, without an urgent vaccination rollout, we will be stuck in perpetual lockdowns. Joining me today to discuss where to from here, I have J John Stenays and DA leader, Dr. Noma French Mbombo, the Western Cape Health MEC, and Bridget Masango, the DA Shadow Minister of Social Development. And we are joined on Zoom by J Jack Bloom, the DA Shadow MEC for Health. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Inside Track. Hi, Steve. Okay. I want to get stuck into it. I think um, often, you know, as politicians, we're very much easy, quick to talk about the economic devastation or the political devastation of lockdowns. But all of us here are humans and we experience lockdowns in very different ways. And it's been a hard time for South Africans. I just want to hear from you guys. I mean, what have been your personal reflections of how lockdown was like for you, John? Well, I think the hardest thing for me was not being able to, for a number of months, see my two older children who live in Durban. Uh, and, you know, going that long period without being able to interact with your own children was really, really tough. Um, obviously, you know, we each have our own personal uh, experience of the crises, but that for me was, was one of the hardest things to be able to, to get through. Absolutely. And Lama French, I mean, you were working in the front lines of the pandemic from day one. What, what was your personal experience of the lockdown period? Um, yes, if you are, so for me, uh, it's difficult to separate what I do in the health space from personal, because I've been a healthcare worker, uh, occupying various positions, being a clinician before, being an educator in health work, being a researcher, being a manager in different provinces, but now I'm a politician in health work. So when your colleagues throughout, not only in the province, but throughout the South Africa as healthcare workers, when you feel that there's never been any other time that a health system has been so fragile, we were coming from HIV AIDS at the time, but at least during that time, it doesn't have such a huge impact mm. visible on health workers rendering their services. But now we talk about the health workers, they were infected and affected. 
But the most important of all is about when the patients, relatives, cannot be able to come and visit. Mm -hmm. And when you deliver services and then there's one part that is not there, that human part of it uh, for the support, it does have a toll on health workers. So yeah. that's why for me, I, I never stayed home. Yeah. I gallivanted throughout just to show and give support that we are there for you. Mm. We understand uh, how this affects you. Yeah. And obviously leading healthcare workers, you wanted to lead by example. Exactly. And exactly. Bridget, for you, what was the most difficult thing about lockdown? <laughs> Well, uh, it, um, for me, it became very real when I couldn't go to my mother's place in KZN on her birthday, because whenever I'm not able to be with her, even at Christmas, but I make sure that at least I see her in September. Mm. And I couldn't do that. And for me, it became very real. Mm. The whole, you know, the reality of, of the lockdown was was pronounced at mm. that time because mm. obviously I could phone her but it wasn't the same. Not the same, yeah. yeah. And I mean despite the harrowing images of like empty streets which I'd never seen before, I mean <laughs> yes. one of the most you know traumatic things for me was losing my mom oh. during that time and not being able to go home and yeah. properly grieve uh, yeah. with my family and yeah. And you know, and and funerals were so different, yes. and it just looked strange and felt strange. Yes. But um, it's because we know South Africans have had a really, really tough time, and that's why I wanted all of you to share mm -hmm. your personal stories. Yes. John, I want to get stuck into it. Uh, we have seen it's been a year of lockdown, and as the official opposition, we had to change the way in which we did our work mm -hmm. uh, when this crisis was announced. What were some of the things that we had to do and do differently and some of the highlights for you? Sure. Well, I mean, obviously, one of the things we had to do was pivot towards finding solutions. Um, you know, as a, a, we are in opposition, but we've also got a duty to put on the table alternatives, particularly in the time of great crisis for the country. And I'm very proud of the fact that the party was able to pivot so quickly into coming up with realistic solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm very proud of, of what our governments were able to do, and I'm sure we're going to talk a little bit about that later. But just from the, from the party's position, opposition, being able to uh, change our communication method, no more mass meetings allowed, no more house meetings, no more rallies. We had to find a way to communicate to people. So uh, we started a Corona cast, and it started with you, Sibi. We're in my lounge, and uh, you know the first broadcast, and it eventually evolved into a studio. And what we were doing was stepping into the information gap that had been left by government. You know, a lot of people were unsure, uh, unaware of what was going on. And I think Corona Cast was able to fill that gap mm. and have people talking every week with experts in to talk about about the rollout and, and what was happening and what people could expect. And the team told me that actually it got over four million views, yeah. Corona Cast. Uh, four million views. Yeah. And it's also, I think, changed the way we do political communication, which is why I think we're sitting today in this studio mm. on the inside track, because we can now communicate to South Africans directly. But I'm also really, really, really proud of the work that we were able to produce as an opposition party. The, from the Blue Book, which we set out in the first uh, week of the crisis, which was a ministry by ministry approach to what needed to be done to prepare the country, to the smart lockdown model, which uh, we believe uh, was cutting edge at the time and had the testing, tracing and tracking been done at the level that it was promised, I think it would have uh, worked a lot better than this current model that we have. Mm -hmm. um, and then our COVID-19 action plan for the incapable state, which essentially took the learnings of uh, what the party's experience, where it was in government, and distilled those into a book which we gave to government. All of these, I think, were solutions-oriented approaches to how could we save both lives and livelihoods. We were also the first party to talk about lives and livelihoods, understanding that this pandemic would transcend just a health crisis. Mm -hmm. It would turn into an economic crisis as well. And I think yeah. uh, you know that we were certainly way ahead of our time in talking about that. Yeah, and John, I just want to, just a quick follow up on that. I mean, often uh, opposition parties come under heavy criticism mm. that we don't come up with solutions. Mm. And so, I mean, what was the motivating factor to say, well, you know, whether or not there's a platform created by government, mm. we're still going to, yeah. you know, respond to the crisis and work and, and, and offer our, 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 our assistance. I mean, mm. I remember you asked us all to write a letter to our mm. counterparts in mm. government to say, I'm here to assist. Mm. Absolutely, and I think that there's, a, in a time of crisis, crisis, we must always remember we're South Africans first. Before we put on a t-shirt or anything, we are South Africans. Mm -hmm. And it is in our interest to make sure that South Africa works because we love the country. And so that meant reaching across the aisle to ministers and saying, hi, we're here, we have resources, we can help, bring us on board, 
let us uh, contribute to to the platform. And by and large, uh, quite a few of the things that we put on the table were adopted. Uh, unfortunately, many of them ran headlong into the incapable state, as I'm sure Bridget will be able to talk about later. But um, I think there is a, a duty of an opposition party to not only oppose, but to be able to put on the table workable, constructive alternatives. And that is something that we've done certainly over the course of the last two and two and a half years, being able to really focus on what are the things that we need to, to get South Africa through this pandemic? What are these things we need to do to get South Africa onto a growth trajectory? And what do we need to do to get people out of poverty and into opportunity? And those are, that is where our focus on solutions uh, is focused. Yeah, that's certainly been my most inspiring mm. uh, aspect of actually of this pandemic. Bridget, I want to bring you in here. Mm -hmm. There was a case uh, where government was not, at the, where cooked food was being banned from being distributed in poor communities mm -hmm. by NGOs. Mm -hmm. And we took this matter to court, we won. Yeah. What was the case about? What was this crisis? You know, it, it's very important to note, Siv, that the issue of the lockdown found especially the Department of Social Development in a very, very precarious, a very, very um, disadvantaged position because there was a huge lack of capacity well before uh, lockdown. So when the minister through those uh, infamous uh, directives, draft directives that were issued to say uh, NGOs and ordinary South Africans would need permits to actually give a neighbor a plate of food. Mm. And in, in the detail in there was so horrible that people needed to write the, the ID numbers of the people they were about to give food. And if that doesn't happen, you must report to your local uh, police station or something like it was it was horrendous. There are people that were thinking that these were f fake news, yeah. that we were actually just cooking this up because no government, which is already so depleted in terms of capacity, could expect such from South Africans. So that is what the, the directives were about. And people were finding it very difficult to help their neighbors, to, to for their NGOs to actually go into open spaces and give food to people. And that's when we were getting calls, emails, everything to say, please, Democratic Alliance, do something about this. This is bringing about a humanitarian crisis sure. into this country. And that's when we went to court to say, you have, this has to stop because people are already dying. People who were already unemployed. We were sitting at 32% unemployment rate at the time. So you, you really had a a crisis on your hands, which is why we then went to court and we, we, we actually uh, won that case and the minister had to stop those uh, draft directives which were, which were implemented before they were even not draft. Mm. Which, which was just so mm. bizarre. It was, it was a scary. You, you felt at times like you were watching a movie, yeah. uh, but you were part of it. You know, it was amazing. And Mama French, I mean, I mean the indignity. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because it's one thing being unemployed, but yep. now you know you can't even get a, a temporary job to yes. feed your family. I mean, the yes. indignity of just not knowing where your meal is going to come yes. from in some of the communities we yep. work in. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Because health has to absorb all of those. Yes. Uh, when there's a hunger, when there's a poverty when there's a, a, a low economy, people are unemployed, it means mm. we have to absorb all of those. Mm. Yes. Uh, un unfortunately, and yet we don't even have a budget. Sure. Yeah. And even and the food uh, nutrition at schools, yeah. because we continue yeah, as a Western Cape, yes. but everywhere it was yeah. closed. And yeah. yet the kids were at home. Yeah. Mm. That, I, mean, I was going to say, I mean, that was the other thing. I mean, the Western mm. Cape school feeding scheme mm. is for many children the only decent meal they get in a day. Mm. And, and the Western Cape government was told to stop the feeding scheme. And thank goodness that the government uh, had the courage to be able to say, sorry, we're not going to stop feeding hungry children in this province yeah. because uh, you know, it's, it, it's just inhumane yeah. and yeah. carried on with it and yeah. defied yeah. government. And yes. I think that acting in the best interest of the people of the Western Cape. Absolutely. Uh, now, my friends, let me bring you in here. And I mean, to, to then talk about looking at the past year. As a provincial MEC, you oversaw the Western Cape's response to COVID-19. Mm -hmm. um, Professor Karim, who co-chairs the Ministerial Advisory Committee, has been on record having said, look, the Western Cape has some great uh, lessons that we can take on board. Mm -hmm. What do you think were some of the things that worked and some of the lessons and maybe some of your proudest moments in this time of crisis? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, thanks, Steve. 
Uh, just want to also acknowledge that today is the World TB Day, okay. so the clock is ticking to end TB, mm -hmm. because you mustn't think that other diseases are on holiday. Yes. <laughs> uh, because D TB is one of the, also the biggest uh, killers mm -hmm. in South Africa, even before we had COVID, just mm -hmm. to acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, indeed. It has been quite a, a, a long year uh, when we had our first case uh, on, the, on the 11th, because for the country it was on the 5th. Uh, but what stands out is about uh, us being the laboratory, the lab, or the classroom for the whole South Africa where systems could be tested mm. so that other provinces, when they ended up having their highest period of having pandemic, pandemic, they could copy those. Mm. So that's why for us, the scientific evidence was a core. Mm. Uh, so that even later on, a student could be able to take up the data and make use of it. Mm -hmm. Noting that uh, the, the virus mirrored differently in every country, so it was difficult for us to transplant some of the lessons coming from all over the world. Yeah. But the first thing, first it was about, because we saw in the US, UK, where beds are needed, that yeah. it just shouldn't be any other person who ended up being left without a bed, mm -hmm. irrespective of how the person are getting affected by the COVID. Mm. So different kinds of beds. The first thing was about the hospital beds. Hence, we have to discharge as many people. But you cannot just discharge people. Yeah. And then, especially for the chronic uh, uh, persons, where they will need the medication. Mm -hmm. Hence, we, we, we use Uber mm -hmm. in order to bring the medicines to the doorsteps mm -hmm. and giving about two months supply, which we still continue. Sure. Because you avoid a situation of bringing a whole lot of the traffic mm -hmm. of the people coming to the hospital mm -hmm. and end up being infected because the mere fact that you're on chronic medication, it means you're vulnerable mm -hmm. and also are high risk to get um, infection. Mm -hmm. Critical care beds. No country, public spaces, they've got critical beds. You might have the bed as a bed, but you need staff, yeah. highly specialized staff. Mm -hmm. And in South Africa, including Western Cape, you don't have that luxury. Therefore, you need a public private. Mm -hmm. I recall the first meeting I had with all the private groups in my office, uh, even before we even had a case at yeah. the time, because we had actually false alarms. I think we had 32 before we even have our own main case, where I said, uh, um, Guys, medic clinic, net care, uh, medical, uh, uh, medic cro uh, um, uh, cross, uh, life, and all of those where they were there, all of them. I said, we need you for critical beds. Yeah. But the first thing that I have to do, I have to review our regulations mm -hmm. where they, um, they are very strict in regard to all these terms of the allocation of the beds, where we say that now we are welcome, do your thing, so that we could be able to transfer critical care patients there. Meanwhile, uh, we urge those because it's also about the competence of the national in terms of the tariffs. Mm -hmm. Because I remember one time where they were saying that we're waiting for the national minister to sign off the tariffs because the monies and whatever have been negotiated. Where I have to call the national minister and then on that day he signed it off so that we be ready. But fortunately, uh, when the demexamethasone came in, we were the first to, to uh, experiment, uh, to, I mean, to pilot it, mm. where we could be able to minimize people going to the uh, ventilators in the ICU. Is that the high flow oxygen? Yeah, the dexamethasone, where you give it as part of the, um, when especially for the people who could be in ventilators, so that you reduce the time the people, um, okay. and also the morbidities in regard to when the people need that space. But it made it at least not to uh, um, transfer uh, the critical care patients to the to the hospital because like in Khrotskir you don't need uh, to manage them in the ICU okay. so it may it reduce that part the field hospitals which is we don't have in South Africa within a month we built a 860 bed uh, converting the city ICC yeah. inclusive the whole furniture appointing the whole staff I remember once um, within a, a day, we had about more than 800 applications sure. mm -hmm. uh, from across. We asked that they be allowed to come in some of them, not only from, uh, I mean, from Western Cape, also from across. Our information system, immediately the dashboard, which we won awards, by the way, we yes, competed yes. with a private, where every day, you get all of which is still people are, get, are receiving uh, actually um, uh, all of those stuff at the time because it was approaching winter, uh, coming late 7 p.m. where you don't have a transport or arriving for 7 a.m. you have a transport negotiated uh, with the Department of Public Works to have a red dot. Yeah. So the two different types, the red dot, 
uh, where you could use it as a taxi mm -hmm. uh, to um, to bring patients to the Q and I uh, quarantine isolation site, red dot light where you can transport the staff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we had many of these uh, innovations. Uh, in no? Innovations, but what is crucial because I want to piggyback on what uh, Richard has indicated. <coughs> you cannot work it alone. Yeah. You need other sectors. Yeah. Yeah. So from the mayors in the local government, they form part of the district command council. Mm -hmm. uh, from the also uh, the premier as the chairperson of the provincial command council ended up also being chairing all of those yeah. but lastly about the whole of society approach yeah. the faith-based organizations yeah. uh, so that we bridge that gap of the spiritual support and all of those yeah. uh, the civil society sector yeah. in regard to the food space the mm. academia and all of those so yeah. we've went through <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah lessons learned i mean don i mean this has been one hell of a uh, you know a, a delivery from yeah. the western cape government I think there's some there are great lessons to be learned, but also great moments to be proud of. Yes, absolutely. And I mean, I think that, I mean, normal French is mm. in the limited time only be able to talk about just some of them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's just so many more innovations that the province was able to bring about that I think is going to revolutionise healthcare yeah. in the province going forward. For instance, mm. in medicine delivery, etc. Mm. Uh, I think these are, are, are things that would, would help improve health care in the province yeah, going yeah, forward. Yeah. But really a stellar effort. And I don't think the Western Cape government gets nearly as much credit as it should, but it does show something important. Yeah. And it's something I touched a little bit earlier, and that's the importance of having a capable state. Yeah. Right. What happened is when the going got tough, because the Western Cape had a capable government built up over many, many years, mm. once the going got tough, they were able to immediately spring into action. Yeah. And you saw that translated into immediate action on the ground. Yeah. Right. Hospitals being built, uh, while Gauteng was digging graves, mm -hmm. we, were, we were building hospitals. Yeah. Yeah. While you know, other provinces were buying scooters, we were buying oxygen. Yeah. Mm. And that is the capable state at work and shows very clearly why we need a capable state at a national level if we're going to get South Africa moving forward. Speaking of that, capable state and an incapable state, we find ourselves at a crossroads. Mm. Uh, on Monday, during the Human Rights Day, you announced that, you know, we, we are possibly at the worst possible failure by government in 27 years because of the failure to roll out a vaccine. Unpack that for us. Well, I think that, you know, if one looks at the human rights that are guaranteed in terms of the Bill of Rights and the Constitution, we have a right to adequate health care, you've got a right to life. Mm -hmm. Government's abject failure and dropping the ball so spectacularly on vaccines is, I think, one of the greatest disservices they've done to the, the South African population since the advent of democracy. Essentially, people are going to die in a third wave unnecessarily mm -hmm. because had we been vaccinating at scale since the end of last year, as many of the other competitor countries have done, and being able to roll out vaccines, we would have been able to save many, many more lives. We'd be able to reduce the burden on hospitals. We'd be able to ensure that other um, health impacts, HIV, AIDS, TB, as Norma French just said, that don't just disappear in a yeah. pandemic. The, mm. the burden of those are still there and, and often they, they suffer as a result and livelihoods are going to lost. People are going to go hungry. And all of this could have been avoided had government just done its job and got into the vaccine race when it should have. Yeah. And, you know, there's this myth that does the rounds that the president likes to perpetrate, that it's all these Western countries that have ganged up against the developing world. That's not the case. If you look at Chile, Peru, Argentina, Brazil, all these other countries are vaccinating at huge scale and as quickly as possible, and yet they're, they're in the same neighbourhood uh, in terms of emerging markets as we are. There is no excuse. Yeah. The president has dropped the ball here. And I think, as we said earlier, another issue, had this been in any other country in the world, the government would have resigned. In its entirety. It, it, it would have been resigned in its entirety, like the, yes. like the Dutch government did. Instead, the president keeps coming on TV and the health minister keeps coming on TV and saying, well, vaccines are coming. And then you try and pin them down to a date. And it's always this vague, well, secured to come in the second quarter. Well, that could mean anything. Mm. Secured doesn't mean signed for purchased, arriving on X date to be rolled out. And then there's the rollout as well. Yeah. We've already seen... The vaccination rollout here is pitifully slow. Those vaccines that we've got, the trial vaccines, mm -hmm. are being rolled out far too slowly. Uh, and our vaccine tracker that you know we displayed a little bit earlier shows very clearly how far behind we actually are in terms of meeting our targets. Mm -hmm. And those were unambitious targets, yeah. and we we're yeah. unable to meet yeah. them. This is a human rights violation of a grand scale. Mm -hmm. And citizens, you know, while the, while the government may not want to hold itself accountable, 
citizens are going to have an opportunity through their votes later this year to be able to hold government accountable. And I would urge them to exercise those, those votes to pass judgment on the way government has left them exposed economically, exposed from a health perspective, and exposed from a well-being of their future perspective. This is their chance to be able to say, sorry guys, really, what you've done is really not good enough and we're not going to tolerate incapable government. Yeah. Again, look, I, governments make mistakes from time to time. This is not a mistake. This was a deliberate bungling. It was a fight between Treasury and the Health Department around a whole variety of issues. The only for the first time that, that the Health Department applied for a waiver from Treasury was in January this year. If this current pace continues. We're going to be sitting with coronavirus while many other countries have long exited it. Mm -hmm. And it's going to impact on our ability to attract tourists as well as to travel to other countries. Devastating impact. Yeah, absolutely. Jack, I want to bring you in here. Jack, you've been very instrumental in Gauteng in exposing really the rot of what an incapable state looks like up in the province when we saw the scandal around PPE procurement and COVID relief funds. What were some of the key things that were happening over the past year that we saw um, in, up in the province, which became basically corruption central in the past 12 months? Well, you know, I was the first one to raise questions when the chief financial officer uh, suddenly resigned uh, for, quote, personal reasons at the end of May. And the Premier said it with a straight face that she'd resigned for personal reasons. The MEC for Health said she'd resigned for, for personal reasons. And I raised the question, was there not something else behind this? Were there not uh, uh, corruption allegations? And it turned out, of course, that there were uh, massive uh, uh, corruption allegations. We're all familiar with the PPE scandal, hundreds of million rands just, you know, absolutely wasted, squandered, and, and uh, what PPE they did purchase was substandard. So I think lives could have been lost because of, uh, you know, substandard uh, masks and, and other types of PPE. But, um, you know, the other people have focused on the, the PPE scandal. I think there's a, another broader scandal, in fact, was uh, the, the mismanagement of funds for, for infrastructure. There was yeah. an emergency budget allocation close to 2 billion rand and they were supposed to build extra beds in various hospitals and full staff positions and things like that. Well, what happened with the infrastructure is that a quarter of that money, uh, 500 million rand of it, uh, was squandered on a hospital that uh, Anglo Gold uh, Ashanti donated in the far west rand. They donated the hospitals in fairly good uh, Nick, they could have used it as it is. It wasn't in the most populated area. But no, they decided to remodel it and spend, I mean, it's an absolutely uh, appalling figure, 500 million rand uh, oh. rebuilding it. And to this day, it hasn't seen a single patient. I think it's just going to become an absolute uh, white elephant. It's, it's in the wrong area. If you were going to spend in the West Rand, you should have spent at existing uh, hospitals. So now you're still going to staff it. I don't think this 500 million rand and remodeled hospital yeah. is going to see a single patient. So it's scandals like that that have been really very frustrating because the money is desperately needed for, uh, for, for health care. Yeah. And I mean, Jack, speaking, I mean, about beds and, and, and hospitals and facilities, Gauteng, I mean, had a whole scandal around the Nazarek facility, which was not getting on board for the longest time. They bought furniture beds instead of medical beds, like Noma French was saying earlier. And you were at the forefront of exposing that because people were desperate for beds in the province. Well, they they selected the Nazarek facility uh, according to the Auditor General. Uh, there were irregularities, so I'm not surprised about that. But then they went and signed a six month contract where they were paying for empty beds. Essentially, they had a thousand beds there. And I I recently asked a question. I said, Well, how many patients over this entire period, the entire eight month period, because now they finally closed the the Nazarek Field Hospital, how many patients actually received oxygen? Because you know quarantine patients and isolation patients you could put up at a hotel you didn't need to have a whole huge facility that you're paying a huge amount of money for it turned out that over the entire eight nine month period uh 
238 patients in this 1,000 bed facility uh, received oxygen, which is really the key thing. So those were the real patients. The others were just quarantine and isolation patients and the numbers were very low. So it was a massive uh, waste of money, about 250 million rand in total. And and, uh, in fact, we saw that the beds that they were building or the field hospitals that we should have had were in the wrong places. So what happened with the second wave in December and uh, and January, uh, the Chwani area was terribly affected. And uh, we saw uh, tents in the parking lot of the Steve Biko Hospital. And meanwhile, we had empty beds uh, in Johannesburg. You know, they really dropped the ball. Uh, they, they built uh, beds in the wrong places and they weren't ready. They were all supposed, the extra beds were supposed to all be ready by the end of uh, of September, then it became the end of November, then a lot of those beds weren't ready at the end of January. So yeah. we had this appalling situation at Steve Biko Hospital. Yeah. Now, my friend, I mean, in contrast to what other provinces have seen, as John said, we had Scootergate in the Eastern Cape. We have this issue around PPE corruption. Part of the reason why is that there was no transparency around the awarding of these contracts. The Western Cape decided that it wanted to make procurement completely transparent. What was the motivating factor around that? Yes, um, the the treasurer uh, came up with a, a procurement disclosure, which is every uh, quarter, uh, this is being shared publicly, mm. uh, which companies and what do they get and what is it for, which is very crucial. Because remember, this is not our money. Mm. It's not a party money. Mm. It's not a government money. This money is money from the taxpayers, which is meant for the poor, mm. uh, those who still have to rely on the state. Uh, but also what is crucial, just to go what he, Jack has just indicated, for the whole of the our two billion plus that we use for the PPE, not a single, because remember the AG does quarterly auditing separate from the main auditing of the department for the PPEs for mm. all the provincial health. Not a single finding related to the PPE. We never stole any PPE. Mm. So it has been like that throughout. Before I even forget, just to brag that we just uh, now get, got a confirmation that we have got our second clean audit. Oh. Uh, from the financial previous year and other ones. So it means that it's our second year now we have. Mm. On the Department of Health mm. in okay. South Africa, we have a whole clean audit mm. uh, for the first time. We're not sure whether we'll be able to keep it because 2020, 21 was tough. Yeah. Mm. Because yeah. the staff have to do also the auditing for the, for the other part of it. Mm. But also it's crucial because I think, uh, um, because also uh, John spoke about the availability of the medicine. A value of medicine is part of a system to strengthen the whole health system. Mm. We spoke about the bed, we spoke about the information system, we spoke about human resource system, mm -hmm. availability of medicine, which in this case we are talking about uh, vaccines, is part of it. Mm -hmm. So therefore, there is no health system that can sit and wait mm -hmm. when another system, you see that it is a weak link. Mm -hmm. So that's why for us, we are being proactive, not only to sit and wait for the national, but it's about we do have to strengthen the whole part of the system. It goes back to what we're talking about in terms of the procurement. So that's why we have been open about whoever, whether it's a company, whether it's another government, whoever want to be able for us to procure, they have to follow some of court criteria, but it's open to anyone yeah. because it's our responsibility yeah. um, to do so. So yes, um, uh, lastly, because he mentioned about the Nasrec, people keep on saying that, why did you demolish yes. CTICC? It means you have got nothing, you are not prepared for the third wave. Whilst we were uh, busy having these um, separate individual, like a field hospital, we had hybrid model where we also have field hospitals attached to the main hospitals. Mm -hmm. So like in Stellenbosch, you might have an additional, where we converted a, a lecture theatre, yeah. additional hospital. In the Vescos in Freirendal, where we've got such. In the Garden Route, in the Hericome, we've got such. In the Sonstral, which you saw, we still, and Mitchell's Plain, of course. So we do have actually um, three, four, five, uh, or field Nermanus, hospital. field hospitals yeah. that are attached. So we're using the unused buildings, and then we convert those 
same as with the additional beds, because ideally in future, we don't want a situation where you close other non-COVID services because of the COVID. Yeah. It's a human right issue that yeah. now you have to pause some of the essential, uh, for example, elective surgeries, yeah. because we have to focus on the COVID. Mm -hmm. Ideally, the health system is supposed to be able to enjoy, to absorb, absorb mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. So going forward, whilst we are excited that we are vaccinating the healthcare workers, but when the population is not vaccinated, there'll still be a burden mm -hmm. <laughs> on the system. But although the healthcare workers, at least now, they won't go for 10 days quarantine isolation, they'll be there. Yeah. But remember, they still have got this workload of accommodating all of those. So until a uh, population has been vaccinated, we are not safe. Yeah, absolutely. It's an important point to make there as well. Yeah. And it, it again shows the difference between the Western Cape capable state and the rest of the country's yeah. incapable state. Lockdowns are not meant to be an ongoing solution to COVID. They're meant to buy you enough time to prepare your health system to be ready. And I think that's exactly what the Western Cape did. They used the lockdown period to prepare. So the point is now we don't need the RCC anymore because they've prepared the, uh, you know, the system now to deal with, with any potential yeah. fallout. You're going to see again with the third wave. Yeah. Once again, it's going to be people in provinces like KwaZulu-Natal, Gauteng and others where there's just a completely incompetent government. Those citizens are going to be without hospital beds, without oxygen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Unlike the Western Cape that's got out there and prepared. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the key thing. Bridget, very quickly, I mean, the social assistance in the country is effectively yeah. crumbling. Um, and we're seeing the Department of Social Development unable to essentially provide a safety net for people. Where to from now in Parliament in particular and some of the work you're doing? Well, you are so right. What has happened, which uh, our finance colleagues actually raised very sharply, is that in the coming um, MT uh, MTSF, the, the, the funding for the grants has been slashed. Mm. And so we raised this with the Department of Social Development to say how, when there are so many people that have joined the ranks of the unemployed, of people that are in the middle, where from 19 years to 59 years, there are so many people that are, for example, receiving the, the SRD grant. How can you then justify the slashing of the grants budget. Yeah. And the, the grants budget that is being slashed is actually not enough even. We, we know that in South Africa, unlike maybe in other countries, in South Africa, one person that is receiving a grant is actually taking care of the entire family. So if you are slashing that budget, you are saying that there are families that are going to continue not having food on their table. Yeah. So we've raised this with the minister. We actually forced the, the chairperson of, of, of social development to come back and have this thing discussed at, at the, at the uh, portfolio committee meeting because he was just relaxed. Like, we, let's just wait. We'll see that when we get to that. We were making sure that we wrote to the minister. We wrote to even the president to say, please look at this, because we keep being told, oh, Treasury has, has done this. What, were you, what did you say to yeah. Treasury for them to have done that? Yeah. We are experiencing in the, in the Department of Social Development a situation where the department is part of the Disaster Management Act, so it's supposed to have capacity, human and otherwise, to take care of what is happening. But the SAS staff... For, as far as I remember, are working on a 50% sure. uh, rotational basis when the country is expecting people to be getting, to be getting grants from them and other social services uh, that are, are, are rendered by them. We have a situation now of the temporary disability grants, 200,000 of them that whose grants were, were cut yeah. at, at the end of December. And when we said to the department, you have to extend them while they are applying, mm. because we want the department to keep within the law, yeah. but extend the grants, because these people not only need the grants for the medication, but they need the food to eat while they're taking the medication. That fell on deaf ears. Sure. You would have seen and, and watched the, the embarrassing and, and scary things that happened in here in, in the Western Cape, actually, where those people were water, water cannoned by the SAPS. So you have a situation where the incapable state is not taking any advice from the likes of the Democratic Alliance. When we say 
open, prioritize the PPE for SASA staff and the social development staff for them to come back in full force to be able to serve these people so that they don't get into these super spreaders that we see in queues all over the country. Yeah. It is a situation that we are we are pushing for, 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 for changes to happen, for people in critical positions to be employed, because this is one of the departments that's sitting with vacancies in very critical positions, yeah. Uh, yeah. where the, you have top heavy staff in, in head office and then the client facing uh, 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 offices have no one yeah. to, to look after people. Yeah. You have people who are disabled, who are old, who are weak, who are frail, having to go to these offices. And the children. And, 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 the, and the children. Mm -hmm. And the children on their laps. Mm -hmm. Where is this super spreader, avoiding the super spreader thing? What John was saying and, 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 uh, and, and Norma French was saying earlier on to say, while you are on lockdown, prepare services, yeah. prepare infrastructure. It has not happened with yeah. the Department of Social Development mm -hmm. throughout the country, except obviously the West Western Cape, which was just as 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 good of a lab a laboratory or, or or the classroom for the entire country, yeah. because Minister Shana Fernandez was doing what the other provinces couldn't do, yeah. releasing funding and, and yeah. things like that. Absolutely, John. Final thoughts. Mm. I mean, where to from now? You made um, the the uh, the call on on Human Rights Day. Where to from now as a democratic Great. alliance? So obviously, we've got to put the interests of South Africans first, mm. and we can't just simply sit on our hands and wait for government to come up with a plan or wait for something to turn up. So we've launched the vaccine tracker. We're going to keep government accountable according to their own provinces. We're also going to be looking at uh, further legal action where required to compel government to ensure that South Africans' uh, rights in terms of the Constitution of the Bill of Rights are not violated. And then where we govern a place like the Western Cape, we're going out to look for vaccines mm. to make sure that those populations are protected uh, from the ravages of this. Vaccines are going to be the defining issue of the Ramaphosa presidency. Mm -hmm. His presidency is going to be judged now on whether we can vaccinate at scale and come out through this thing, or whether COVID is going to be something that's with us for another, another year, another two years mm -hmm. going forward. I want to pledge to every South African that's watching that we are going to be on the front lines every single day, mm -hmm. fighting for your right to a vaccine, and to be able to have progressive health care and to be able to run your business and be able to live your life in the way in which you want to live it. What is currently happening by this government's rank incompetence is trampling on the rights of every single South African citizen. It's time now to push back. It's time now to the government starts to feel the heat. And we're going to be on the front line of that struggle to ensure that every South African gets the vaccine that they need so that we can move forward and come out of this crisis and start to rebuild our economy, start to rebuild people's lives and start to rebuild a better future for South Africa. Cool. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to my guests. And thank you for joining us. We will be back after this. Thank you. cities across the country. DA Governed Gulcha Municipality launched a waste management and recycling program with contract jobs for 20 women specifically. To restore dignity, DA Governed Western Cape handed over 212 title deeds in Villiers Dorp. And the DA Governed Garden Route launched a road construction learnership to benefit 90 people. Now, on to this week's D8 work feature, we are joined by Bongigosi Matigizela, the Western Cape Provincial Minister of Transport and Public Works. BM, thank you 
so much for joining us. And uh, we are here in our segment to talk about, obviously, the Blue Dot Taxi Initiative. But before that, I mean, in the discussion we had now, we were talking about the Red Dot. Um, Noma French even mentioned some of the services that your department was able to roll out. Let us know a little bit about what your department did during this crisis over the past year. Steve, thank you. And uh, uh, good day, John. Look, quickly, when... Um, the lockdown level five and level four were introduced by the president. I mean, one of the biggest problems we had was that a number of essential service workers, like, you know, health care workers, um, could not find transport uh, to go home after their shifts. And we immediately engaged the Department of Health and uh, the taxi industry um, to come up with a plan to provide this service. And that is how the Red Dot was, was born. Mm. Um, the minibus taxi industry immediately formed a company called Umanyano, uh, and then we partnered with them to make sure that uh, those people who are working shift and, and uh, more importantly were able to be transported, you know, from work to home. And really it, it was one of the best services because there's always been this talk whether the taxi industry can comply with the law. Yeah. And perhaps I'll, I will expand on that more when we talk about the red dot. But one of the lessons that we've learned from there is that each and every red dot taxi, um, we, we had a device there where we were able to monitor Okay. That, 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 that the taxi operators were complying with the law because at the time, I mean, we had to load 70% of the, of the passengers there. And you know that the taxi industry is notorious of breaking the law. Mm. Not, and secondly, we had to make sure that um, those uh, essential service workers were transported from point A to point B without the taxis, you know, invading other routes. Mm. And the incentive, which is the payment that we made, was based uh, or was, 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 was based on the fact that they were able to comply with those and it worked like a charm. Yeah. So, I mean, it was also a, a lot about, you know, a, you know, as we spoke about earlier, a lot of the whole society approach, getting various industries to buy into the strategy by your department. No, absolutely. I mean, um, earlier on, uh, Noma French spoke about um, the, the, the additional capacity of health um, which is where, as well, the Department of uh, Transport and Public Works, you know, um, partnered with the Department mm. of Health as well to make sure that um, we have enough spaces, you know, especially during, I mean, during crisis. Uh, this, so this whole society approach, you know, first, you know, partnering yeah. uh, with yourselves as yeah. government, because, I mean, uh, you, you would know that sometimes government work in silos. And I think this crisis, you know, forced us as government, you know, to work better together in other spheres of government. Yeah. And, and that is why we're able, you know, to provide uh, the kind of health infrastructure that we are seeing in the Western Cape. And John, I mean, to you, I mean, the, again, you know, this speaks to the issue of a capable state. Here was a government that was able to spring into action, work with other sectors, work with other departments, health, mm. public works, transport. Yes, and I think it also comes down to leadership as well. I mean, you can have a capable state, but you need leadership as well to, to lead that state. And I really am proud of the work that the Western Cape government were able to do. I mean, I remember seeing the footage of Bongi and his uh, fumigation kit going out, actually on the ground, in the taxi ranks, talking to people, getting them involved, getting the buy-in, and making them understand that, not, that these measures were actually in their own interest as well, mm -hmm. and that we wanted to keep their businesses rolling, but they needed to do it safely. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that we saw that happen anywhere else in the country. So, you know, I think that, that, you know, the capable state is one thing, but effective servant leadership that is driven about the needs of the people and not interested in lining pockets and the like makes a huge difference as well. And I'm happy to say that we see that across every department. We've heard Shauna Fernandez, we've had Noma French, here, we've got Bongi with Premier Alan Windy and all of the team. They are providing leadership of a capable state that benefits citizens, and that is a magic formula. Yeah, and at the, yeah, and I mean, and then and, and, and Bongi again. Now I want us to move on to the Blue Dot Taxi, which was, is something now that we've just uh, recently launched, uh, because again, I think it speaks to uh, the issue around innovation and using what's available to us, not just in the traditional government sense of just meeting KPIs and APPs, but thinking outside the box in a time of a pandemic. Steve, I mean, we are we, we using Red Dot as a launch pad um, um, to the Blue Dot. Uh, 
And I think what people need to understand about the minibus taxi industry in South Africa is that, for example, in the Western Cape, more than 50% of the people are using, you know, mini, I mean, uh, taxis. Mm. So this intervention really is meant, you know, to benefit the users, not necessarily the taxi owners or the operators. Now, when you have passengers, more than 50% of the passengers in public transport using taxis, you've got to make sure that you intervene so that they can be serviced, you know, better. Now, what we need to understand as well about the taxi industry in South Africa is that it is structured in a way that incentivizes lawlessness. Mm. And that's what people need to understand. You can f enforce the law until you are blue in the face, but if, for example, a driver has to meet a certain target for the taxi owner before he or she can make his or her own income, I mean, you know, that kind of environment, um, I mean, results in a situation where people will just disregard the law because of the survival instinct. So that is why we said, let us intervene here. And again, the same way we did with Red Dot. And we are now... You know, we have launched the Blue Dot and we will start with 1,300 taxis in all eight regions. Okay. The same approach that we followed um, when we launched the Red Dot where um, we are partnering with the companies. I mean, all these eight regions have their own companies that we are partnering with. And again, in order for them to obey the law, um, they will be paid this incentive. And again, each and every red dot taxi is fitted with a device. And this payment will be on condition that people don't invade routes, mm. people don't speed, people don't overload. And we are able to monitor all these things from our offices because of the device that is there. Mm. And um, maybe the, this, the second thing, I mean, as we rush through, Siv, it, the question is, how do you sustain this going yeah. forward? See, we are wasting a lot of money in South Africa, in the, in the transport industry in particular. If you look at how this, the grant structure is structured, um, we, we have been in talk with the national government to say if this becomes successful, uh, we look at really changing the, the, the public transport grant structure going forward so that uh, the same way we are subsidizing buses, the railway, um, we do the same for the, in the taxi industry using this initiative. And I think um, I'm, I'm really optimistic that it's going to be a huge success mm -hmm. if we can use it the same way. And I mean, so, so, so for somebody sitting at home, Bongi, who's, who wants to understand, I mean, what ultimately is the grand vision for, for something like this? I mean, I heard you speaking about incentivizing people sticking to the law. For people at home, what is their, you know, their greatest benefit if, if you are aimed to change? in the culture? It's a very good question. You know, currently the taxi industry is notorious for being a violent lawlessness industry. Mm. Now, as I said when I started earlier, the, the first pen, person that you think about um, when you start an initiative is the user. I mean, these are our voters. Mm. And this is designed exactly to help our, our, our um, users, users of the public transport. Because each and every person using public transport wants to, I mean, be transported from home to work in a safe, reliable and efficient public transport. And that is what we want to achieve here. And I think this initiative, as I said to you, by having this device, which monitors that um, the, the taxi operators are able to obey the law, mm -hmm. I mean, it simply means that these end users will be able to get that kind of service, uh, which is what we need. And again, you must understand that, I mean, public transport, I mean, is a huge economic yeah. lever mm -hmm. uh, in our yeah. province and in our country. Yeah. And if you can get that right, I mean, you will be able to get the economy right. And for us, I mean, that's very, very important mm. to get the public transport, particularly the minibus taxi industry yeah. in South Africa. But also, I mean, I think that the frustration that people like Bongi and Alan have spoken out about on many occasions is the fact that the public transport sector is spread across all three spheres of government. Mm. There's no consolidated sphere, which makes an integration incredibly difficult to do mm. because, you know, you, you don't have control of the levers. Now, look at the innovation that, that Bongi and his team have been able to bring in the minibus taxi. Imagine if we could do the same on the trains. Mm. Imagine if Bongi at the provincial level had authority over the train system. Now, Cape Town and the province often gets a bad rap for the trains not running on time, the poor quality. It's got nothing to do with the local sphere or the provincial sphere. Yeah. It's a national competence. Well, that's why our argument is, let's 
give you know, those powers to the province mm. so that Bongi can then run an integrated transport system where the minibus taxis work with the, with the trains and then the trains and the minibuses mm. work with the My City bus routes, other bus routes, so that you have an integration that puts the passenger first. You want yeah. to get the person there to work as safely, quickly and as cheaply as possible. Mm. Yeah. That's got to be the goal across the board. And just imagine what we could unleash if Bongi was in charge of the trains here in yeah. the Western Cape. He'd make sure that the trains run on time. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Bongi, lastly, I mean, you spoke very briefly about public transport being an integral part of, of for economic levers. And I think that's an important point. Um, and I'd like you to reflect a little bit about that. Why is it important that we have a functioning public transport system over and above the fact that over half of our people use it? I mean, it, I mean, you would know, Steve, that the majority of our workers, I mean, are using public transport, mm -hmm. um, and we we invest massively in the public transport infrastructure, um, and this department is an infrastructure department, and that is where jobs are created, yeah. and it is very, very important to have an efficient public transport um, that will be able, because as John said. The, the, the situation that we have now in the Western Cape and in, in South Africa is that the goods that should be transported by rail are transported uh, by road. And this is why you have so much congestion. Yeah. And that has a huge impact in our economy because things are not getting you know, to the harbour on time yeah. because of this congestion. And if you can fix the rail and make sure that the goods that should be transported by rail, transported by rail, you can free up you know, the roads so that um, you have efficient public transport that I mean, is using our roads so that you don't have, again, spend so much money you know, um, maintaining the road because of the fact that um, there's a burden now because of the goods that are transported through there. And lastly, Steve, is that you have to make sure that the safety yeah. is, 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 is very, very, you know, um, key to this. And that is why once, if this blue dot becomes successful, you will not have a situation where our passengers are caught in crossfire because the taxis are invading other routes because those routes are more lucrative. Mm -hmm. Because as I said, this is a survival yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. of the fittest industry mm. where you have to make money for your boss and make money for yourself in order to survive. Now, once you provide this stability by making sure that at least you have an income um, at the end of the day and you have this partnership with government um, through this device where we are, we, are, we are able to say, if you are not you know, abiding by these laws, you will not be incentivized. Yeah. I mean, you, 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 will, you, you will end up in a situation where we don't improve in the public transport. I, and and I'm, I'm very excited about this. And many people across the country, really, I mean, um, are, are calling for this now yeah. after they saw it in the Western yeah. Cape and uh, we want to make it a success. And I'm hoping that we can hopefully emulate this across sure. the country as yeah, well. Absolutely. Thank you very much and thank you, Bongi, for coming through and thank you, John, and thank you thank so you. much for joining us. We'll be back after this. Africa. This episode will also mark the end of season one of the Inside Track. 
We have brought you 13 episodes to date and we will be back on the 14th of April with some exciting new innovations. Thank you for engaging with us. Remember, this platform is designed for us to be able to communicate directly with you, to cut out the noise of information overload and fake news. This past year has undoubtedly been the toughest for every single one of us, whether it was losing a loved one, an income, or even the indignity of being plunged into poverty. The only way we can salvage the situation is for us to roll out vaccines that will cushion us against the blow of a third wave of COVID-19 infections. I want to assure you that we will not abandon our station as the official opposition. We will continue playing our crucial role of holding government to account on your behalf and ensuring that we push hard for outcomes. Ultimately, millions of South Africans elected us to serve and we will do exactly that. Until next time, keep it tight, Mzanzi.